Welcome to another edition of the 66 to 87 podcast. I am Tom Reed, joined today, of course, as always, uh, with De- by Dave Bolinari. And of course, uh, the listeners to the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcast Network know that we've, we, we've launched some new podcast. Our normal co host, Taylor Haas, now has her own venture with Jordan and Jenna. I hope you guys were able to listen to the podcast on 5th. We, wel- we uh, wish them nothing but the best. We have a lot to get to today. A little bit later, we will be joined by uh, Turner Broadcasting uh, Network analyst, former NBC analyst, Keith Jones. And Keith, obviously, is a real good source for the Flyers. We're going to talk to him about the Flyers. They're busy offseason, but uh, they have a lot of news here in Pittsburgh. Uh, let's start with the biggest news of the week. TJ TJ Watt finally signed a uh, hundred million, hundred and eighteen million or whatever. Uh, he's from Wisconsin. We know the Watt boys can play hockey, Dave. Uh, with all that money, you think TJ could double 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 do, do double duty for about a month and play center for the Penguins? I could see him being a good checking line center. Joel Otto, uh, like a Joel Otto, big Joel Otto. <laughs> Yeah, that's and uh, you know, given given the state of the the Penguins' depth chart at center right now, I you know, I think he'd have to be at least a fifty fifty bet to be on the opening night roster. Uh, obviously, for for Pe- Penguins fans and Pittsburgh fans in general, the big the real big news uh, this week that the news that was kind of shocking was that 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 uh, Sidney Crosby uh, will miss at least uh, looks like the first six weeks here. Uh, not of the season, but he'll be out for six weeks as he has undergone uh, surgery uh, to his left wrist. Uh, he's had surgery on that in the past. And uh, the day this seemed to come out of nowhere. I, uh, you're as connected as anybody in this business. Uh, shocked to hear something like this? Yeah, I mean, there, there really had been no indication that, that surgery was anything that was on the table uh, for him. And, you know, when, when you get this close to, uh, a training camp, it seems like the, the chances of a guy having any sort of significant surgery, uh, w- would be lessened. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, I have to admit that, uh, th- this one really caught me flat footed. I think that most fans in any sport, when they find out something as, as training camp is approaching, and you hear a story of a GM or front office people coming out and say a star player or a very important player on this team is going to need surgery is going to be out for a while. The first thing that comes up, especially as they explain it, it was a this wasn't something that happened playing basketball over the summer was why in the heck did he not have this in July or, or something like that? I know Ron Hextall addressed this the other day when he t- when he spoke to the media media. Dave, what was his explanation and what did you take from it? Well, and I mean, his uh, his explanation certainly w- was plausible. Uh, neither the player nor the team wanted to uh, resort to to a surgical uh, method of, of addressing Crosby's issue until uh, all of the less extreme options had been explored. I mean, I think ideally... Uh, you know, they they would have known a couple of months ago that that the uh, the non-invasive uh, things that they tried would be unsuccessful, and you know he could have had the uh, the operation and been back in time for for the start of camp. But you know, it's kind of hard to blame them. I I don't think you want to you know operate unless you really have no other choice. So you know, it's. Uh, it's easy with the benefit of hindsight to second guess the decision to to put surgery off until now, but uh, you know realistically, I, I find it hard to uh, to blame either the player or the team too much for uh, you know trying to see if if the uh, problem could be rectified with uh, some other means. Yeah. Uh, Dave's got a really nice story up. I hope you, I know you, this is anyone can listen to this, our, our 66 to 87 podcast, and we appreciate your patronage. We hope you're also a subscriber to DK Pittsburgh sports. Dave has a really nice story. I, I really enjoyed reading this, the, uh, entitled imagine Crosby, his wrist repaired, elevating his game. But Dave, one of the things that you looked 
back into this story was kind of that there might have been some signs of this late last season. And obviously, the big story in the, in, in the six-game loss to uh, the Islanders was Tristan Jari. Uh, but anyone who watched that series just knew, could see that Crosby wasn't necessarily at the top of his game. We especially saw it in game six. And I do wonder, you know, did we see signs of maybe uh, this problem uh, rearing its head late in last season? And you, you go into a, a pretty good explanation with numbers to back it up. Well, you certainly could make that case. I mean, with, with all due respect to the Islanders who, you know, played very well and, you know, earned, earned their place in, in the second round, uh, Crosby did not play to the level that is reasonably expected of him. Uh, he had one goal and one assist in six games. And, and perhaps the most striking stat to me was that he had a losing record on faceoffs in each of the final five games of, of mm. the, the series. Uh, you know, the Islanders are a good faceoff team. They have a number of, you know, centermen who are, are very effective on draws. But uh, Crosby finished over 53% on face-offs uh, during the regular season. But in the Islander series, in those final five games, he won, I believe it was 38 of 100 uh, draws, yeah. which, which is just way below what you would expect from him. And, um, you know, a, uh, a, a wrist that, that is lacking strength or is causing pain is a uh, pretty – reasonable explanation for for why a good face-off man w would struggle. Uh, David, another question I think some fans out there that, that have seen teams, uh, i.e. the Tampa Bay Lightning, uh, have used the long-term injury uh, out as a way to add to the roster. Uh, now, now this is the beginning of the season, not the end of the season. Uh, why do you think that's really not an option here? Well, I mean, it's actually good news for the Penguins that at this point it doesn't uh, seem to be an, an option that's under consideration. And that's that uh, Crosby and Evgeny Malkin, who's recovering from knee surgery, uh, while neither apparently will be ready for the start of the regular season, neither is expected to miss the entire season or anything close to it, as Nikita Kucherov did uh, with the light season. Uh, which uh, created a lot of salary cap space that uh, you know allowed them to to bring in some personnel and then uh, through fortunate timing or uh, happy coincidence or whatever uh, you know Kucherov was able to return uh, for the playoffs when when the salary cap isn't in effect so uh, Tampa Bay kind of got the best of of both worlds in that, you know, it was able to get through the regular season with the other people it had around and then really, you know, fortify its uh, its lineup by by adding him for the playoffs. Uh, you know, at this point, I suppose it's always possible that Malkin or Crosby could have a major setback and that uh, Ron Hextall would, would revisit the idea of putting one of them on, on the long-term injured list. But, but for right now, that doesn't seem like something that they're seriously considering. Uh, I, I think the, the natural reaction of, of fans when they hear a player is going to be out and maybe miss the beginning of the season. And obviously we know that's going to be the case with Malkin for sure. And it looks like Crosby, as you look at, at the, at the, at the schedule and my goodness, uh, the NHL is not doing the Penguins any favors at Tampa Bay to open the season, uh, at Florida, then the Blackhawks, who are should be a pretty good team, Dallas, uh, the Maple Leafs, and Lightning. That's the Lightning twice in the first six games. Uh, it's going to be a, quite a challenge here for the local hockey team. Well, I, I think that every game they play without Crosby or Malkin is going to be a challenge for the local hockey team, um, you know, whether it's against Tampa Bay or Seattle. Uh, you know, the, the Penguins are not going to overwhelm anybody with, uh, with talent, certainly. Um, but, you know, there's, that, that's something that's out of their control. There's no point in them, uh, 
you know, wasting any time or energy worrying about what the schedule looks like. You have to uh, play them as they come. And, uh, you know, the good thing for them, I think, uh, is that after opening those those games, you know, with two games uh, in the state of Florida, uh, they come home until what seems like midwinter. <laughs> yeah. An incredibly long homestand. So they will at least have you know, home ice advantage working in their favor, even if they do have a uh, rather diluted lineup then. Yeah, and I guess if there's any silver lining here, uh, this is going to happen in a regular 82-game schedule. Boy, if this happened last year with a 56-game schedule and that's starting out and you're missing your two best players, uh, they might have dug themselves into a hole that would have been, they would have spent a lot of that short season digging themselves out of uh when we come back we're going to continue on this subject we're going to talk about what the penguins might do to fill those holes early in the season again we'll have keith jones on a little bit later so stick with us here on the 66 to 87 podcast Welcome back to the 66 to 87 podcast. Uh, Dave, I think the after the initial shock of the the, the announcement of, of Crosby's injury, uh, the natural question becomes, what now? Uh, we're so used to this team starting a season with two of the best centers, two future Hall of Famers in the lineup. That's not going to be the case, at least in those first week or two, and uh, it's going to add some intrigue to training camp. Um, we'll get to this in a second, but I'll mention it now just to set it up. Last Friday, uh, just a very short story. It's, it's obviously this is the time of year where you see professional tryout contracts offered around the league. And the Penguins added uh, forward Brian Boyle, center Brian Boyle, and Matt Barkowski, a defenseman who is a local product, Mount Lebanon kid, uh, 31 years old, I believe. So you know, we'll see what happens with Matt with Matt Barkowski. But Brian Boyle becomes kind of an intriguing, even though he's 36 years old. Uh, you can't say he's going to lose a step because he never had one to lose. We'll see what happens with him. But Dave, uh, he's certainly not going to jump in on the first or second line, even if he makes the team right away uh, as we head into camp here in the next week or so. Uh, how do you think that the, the uh, uh, Mike Sullivan – tries to work around this situation without having his top two centers available? Well, it, it certainly won't be easy. Um, you know, Jeff Carter, all of a sudden, I think, uh, will become the first line center. Um, I don't know if they, if they will break up uh, Teddy Bluger's line to, you know, he would be at least their second best center uh, with Crosby and Malkin out. But perhaps you... You leave his line intact and, and you put a guy like, you know, Evan Rodriguez in the middle of your second line and, you know, on in, in the hopes that he can uh, be an effective Band-Aid in, until you get uh, at least one of your, your top two guys back. Uh, I, I'm guessing that when they uh, got Boyle to accept the, uh, the professional tryout deal, uh, that they were at least aware that there was a, a pretty good possibility that you know they were going to have to resort to surgery uh, on Crosby. Uh, if uh, you know if Boyle is uh, the player he was a few years ago, you know he could certainly help them in some bottom six capacity um, for the start of the season. But you know not only is he older i believe he's 36 now correct uh he sat out last season which you know is not uh encouraging i think for uh you know being optimistic about about his chances of, of performing effectively at this level but you have to believe that he will certainly uh be given the opportunity 
to earn a, at least a, a two-way contract. I don't know if the Penguins would want to commit to him for a full season, uh, you know, of, of pay at the NHL level. But, um, you know, I, I could see him, you know, if he comes in and, and performs credibly, I, I could see giving him a two-way. And if he, and if he exceeds expectations, then, then maybe you do give him a, you know, a, a one-way deal because while they don't have much salary cap space to work with, certainly not enough to cover even a, an NHL minimum salary for him, they do have, I believe, five contracts before they uh, would hit the league maximum. So at least they wouldn't have to worry about that. Bluger is a guy, Dave, that, that I think e- even in talking to him, and I guess every player has confidence in his own ability, has kind of w- wanted this opportunity. Uh, typecast as a third, fourth line guy, and you're you're always going to be that on a team that has Sidney Crosby and Evgeny Malkin. But I would believe that this is an opportunity for him to say to show, all right, kid, you think that you can handle it? You think you can be more than just a checking center, a guy that can kill penalties, win some faceoffs? This is a, a real opportunity for him. Well, I mean, I I think he would be capable of performing credibly you know, as the number two center, at least on a short-term basis. But I wonder if in the big picture, the grand scheme of things, if he isn't more successful centering a really good third line than he would be, you know, filling in on on a second line. When you do have a guy like Evan Rodriguez, who conceivably, you know, could – could perform at, at an acceptable level, at least for a few weeks, you know, in, in a second line role. You know, he does have some offensive abilities. Um, you know, that that's a decision that obviously will be up to the coaching staff. And and I wouldn't be surprised if, if we see uh, them experiment with, with Bluger in both roles sure. uh, o- over the course of training camp. Uh, who would get – who do you think then – Let's let's take it a step further. Obviously, Sidney Crosby plays on the top power play, uh, is is used in almost all major situations. But from a special team standpoint, from the power play, uh, who gets who gets his opportunity? Who gets his ice time there? Well, I mean, and you might have to reconfigure the whole unit if you want to consider Malkin to be part of it as well. Um, you know, Malkin wasn't always on the number one unit, but, you know, probably more often than not. Um, I would think at the, at the very least that, that would open up a, a spot somewhere, quite possibly uh, on along the uh, the left wing boards or in the left circle for, for Kasperi Kapanen. Mm-hmm. Um, but, yeah, I mean, that's, uh, I think you'll see ample experimentation with a with a number one power play, and presumably they will really load up that number one unit as much as possible, and hope that they can get maximum production out out of that unit, as opposed to possibly trying to spread the talent out a bit o- over two units. Yeah, you know, Dave, we've we've seen obviously fans are well aware that 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 it's it, there have been stretches in this team's history with Crosby and Malkin as part of it, where they've been out of the lineup for long stretches of time. And we have seen this team survive. And one of the ways they've always seemed to do it, even last year, uh, they may have actually may have both been in the lineup at this point. I I can't remember, but they, they have shown stretches where they can, uh, we think of the Penguins as this high scoring team that can, they go out and they're they're all about offense, but we've seen this team play very well defensively. I would have to think, at least to start this season, they are going to be a little bit more cautious and maybe try to grind out some results uh, without those two guys in the lineup. In, in the past, they've shown they've shown the the ability to do that. Oh yeah, and you know, uh, desperation can bring out you know, a, a lot of things in, in individual players and, and a team. And, and certainly, um, you know, the, the Penguins will have to go into this season, uh, assuming that neither Malkin nor Crosby is around then, knowing that they're not going to want to get into shootouts with anybody. Right. You know, that they're going to have to rely on 
good uh, team defense, you know, a five-man commitment to defense, good special teams play, and particularly special good goaltending. Uh, if they do that, you know, I, I think they will be able to remain afloat um, for quite a while, uh, you know, w- without Crosby or Malkin. And obviously at some point they're going to have to get those guys back. You can't, you can't go through, you know, go for months at a time without both of them. That's, you know, that's just not realistic. They're, the the league and the division are, are, are too balanced. There are too many good teams out there. But, you know, I, Mike Sullivan, you know, coaches, uh, you know, a, a good 200 foot game. And it, it's a, you know, when uh, I think when, when the players grasp that, you know, they're going to have to focus on, on, on playing well defensively, you know, I think they will be capable of doing that. Yeah. And again, like, like I said, I, I, it's we don't want to the sky is not falling here it, it, again as you mentioned it's early it's this is happening early in the year it's an 82 game schedule uh they will have time to kind of work their way back it is it is a good division i want to get back to Boyle for a second um mike sullivan will be very familiar uh with brian Boyle. uh he um sullivan was assistant to john tortorella in new york when Boyle was there uh Boyle had some good years with the Rangers. He certainly was a part of that the, the 2012 team that made the run to the conference finals. I know we're talking nine years ago, so I, I want to broach that right away. We're, we're, uh, but there is familiarity there. Uh, Boyle is a proven playoff player, but he's 36 years old. Uh, I do think that he's the guy potentially capable of helping them in the short term. Well, potentially, but you know, he's he's not the guy that Mike Sullivan coached, you know, in Manhattan. <clears throat> uh, that was a lot of years ago, and you know, Boyle has a lot of hard miles on him. Uh, I'm certainly not trying to suggest that that he won't be able to uh, perform capably at this level. Uh, you know, haven't seen him play in a couple of years. Uh, but it's certainly not. I, I don't think it should be taken as a as a given that he will be able to to still contribute, you know, to an NHL team on on any sort of consistent basis. That's uh, certainly become one of the uh, the major questions that's going to have to be answered during camp. Yeah, and again, a training camp. Uh, just got a lot more interesting. And we we were just talking about it on a recent episode. Can anyone? rise up uh from the from the prospect pool and and make the team and and i think you guys were both kind of doubtful and probably still at this point so but it is going to be a lot more intriguing camp than than we first thought when we come back we will be joined uh by keith jones and i just want to most of this interview is is about the flyers again we're trying to give you guys as much uh, intel on the other teams as we get closer to camp from people that know these teams inside and out. Uh, uh, one cautionary mention is this, this, this interview uh, was done before the news of the Sidney Crosby uh, injury or the, I'm sorry, the surgery. So when we, when we did ask him a Penguins question, just kind of keep that in mind, but please stay tuned. Keith's always a, a really, really insightful guy. And I think you'll get a lot out of it. And uh, uh, especially about a team that really made a lot of changes in the offseason. So stick with us here on the 66 to 87 podcast. Back to the 66 to 87 podcast. And as promised, we are joined by Keith Jones. Uh, you obviously know him from his terrific work on N- NBCSN for many years. And now he is, uh, as the league jumps over to ESPN and TNT, Keith will be uh, working uh, for TNT. And uh, that's great for hockey fans. Keith, how are you doing today? I'm doing great. It's a lot better, we- but better weather here in Philly than it was just. Uh, a few hours ago. So luckily 
our place didn't get hit too hard, but a lot of good people have had a lot of damage done. Yeah, yeah, we're well, glad you're safe. Uh, uh, you know, obviously one of the stories of the Metro Division at least over this last year or so was the Flyers. Uh, even they started out pretty decent last year and took a precipitous drop. Uh, busy off season. What do you make of that re- revamp Flyers defense, and should it be a significant impact on reducing the goals against average from last season? Yeah, I think it was a huge off season. I think Chuck Fletcher did an incredibly good job in filling the hole that was left by Matt Niskins' early departure and early retirement. Uh, the Flyers were never quite able to rebalance on the fly, and they needed a top-notch right-handed shooting defenseman. And they picked up one in Ryan Ellis, and they picked up another in Ristolainen that can bring not just talent, but also toughness and a little bit of an edge. And that's really been lacking from this live team over the last couple of seasons. So I believe their back end is extremely, extremely better. And I think that's going to benefit everybody, including Carter Hartnett. Yeah, that's what it, that was obviously the, the next question. In your mind, what was really kind of behind uh, Carter Hart's significant drop off last season? Maybe it's kind of what, what, the, what our first question was directed toward. I, I believe that, like watching it unfold during the season, I really think it was about a lack of confidence that the players in front of him were going to make the right decisions. I think he started to try to make those decisions for them. And I think it affected the way that he played his position. I don't think it's any deeper than that. I think he's going to rebound. And he's going to be a very successful goaltender in this league. Um, but I do think he was overthinking things. And that can happen for a young netminder that had you know, a lot of success in his first season. Uh, to have some things change in front of him and then lose his confidence, I, I think all those things contributed to his uh, off season. You know, if Hart does rebound strong and coupled with the upgrades that we've seen the Flyers make this year, are they a legitimate cup contender this coming year? They're a playoff team for sure. Uh, Cup contender, I guess if you make the playoffs, you are a cup contender uh, unless you have to go up against Tampa, although they're revamped now. Um, I, I do believe they're a very good team. I think they're as good as they were two years ago, and many considered them a cup contender that year. Uh, I think that that's where they're headed. I'm not sure I was convinced two years ago that they were as good as some of the teams, including Tampa, uh, that were aiming to win a cup, Vegas being another team that jumped off to me. But I think this Flyers team is definitely going to cause some issues for the rest of their division and the conference. Uh, Keith, you you mentioned the... uh adding some toughness to the blue line. And even with uh, doing that, these flyers are are not a typical, you know, broad street bully, you know, flyers, physical club. How how does the fan base react to that? Because that was always kind of a, uh, a point of pride in Philadelphia. Yeah, I think they enjoy a more physical brand of hockey. I don't think that they necessarily are looking for their team to go out there and fight on a nightly basis and, you know, go back to the Broad Street Bullies days, but they do want an ultra competitive team. Uh, They do want a team, you know, ultimately like Tampa Bay built where they added grit and toughness and put themselves over the top in doing so. I, I think Flyer fans recognize it's still a really important part of the National Hockey League and the Flyers didn't have enough players that had that in them. And I think that's something that's been addressed by Chuck Fletcher in the offseason. And I think it's something that they're going to continue to try to add to. Uh, it used to be an easy piece to add here or there when you're looking for a grinder. It's become a lot more difficult piece to add. And I think we've noticed that at the trade deadline, the price that certain teams have had to pay to pick up players that aren't necessarily going to play in the top six. Oh. Uh, one of the big moves that, that Mr. Fletcher made uh, this summer was was the Voracek Atkinson trade. What do you see the impact of that being on the Flyers? I, I think that it was a low risk move, and they gave themselves some cap space. And remarkably, I think they gained about three million in cap space in the difference between the two players' salaries. 
And Jake still had, I think, three years left on his deal. So Atkinson is more of a goal scorer. He's a player that has more pace to his game and should bring a different element to the Flyers. Also an extremely competitive player and a guy that's going to have a chip on his shoulder wanting to prove that last season was a fluke and not where his career is headed. So I, I think it's a positive move. I think Columbus will be rewarded by Jake Voracek returning there. It's been difficult for the Blue Jackets to keep talent. And Jake certainly is a player that played there in the past and is an extremely talented passer and player and should be a, a happy camper and get the reset and heading back to Columbus. Uh, you're kind of uniquely positioned in that you can – you know, get a get a good look at the Flyers, and also have kind of a, a national perspective on things. Is there a guy on that team who might not be as appreciated around the league as he should be? And the the guy who made me think of that was uh, Joel Farabee. That's uh, I was just going to say that, and he was just rewarded today with a nice new contract. Uh, they extended him, I think, out six more years at a considerable amount of money, and. I think they believe that's low risk based upon his abilities, his attitude, and his improvement from his first year to his second year. And I think the Flyers pounced on the opportunity to lock him up and for good reason. So I think he's more of a household name now than he was, especially here in Philadelphia. And I think he will be around the league in a short period of time. And if you would take a look at the far side of the Commonwealth, do you see Pittsburgh as still a viable Stanley Cup contender, or do you think the window has closed on them? I would consider them in a similar position to the Flyers, that they are a playoff team, uh, but it's getting tougher and tougher for Pittsburgh to get over the top. And I think one issue you have when you have a championship team that's won in the past is they recognize the players that have been there just how difficult it is to win. And sometimes they look around the room and say, man, we do not have the same nucleus that we used to have. And I'm not sure that we can get there. I think that plays into it a little bit with the Penguins, but it would not surprise me at all to see them in the playoffs. And once you're in, anything can happen. All right. Great stuff from Keith Jones. And of course, the hockey fans, very glad, to Keith, that you're you're going to continue on on the national level uh, and TNT. Uh, best of luck with that because I, I think a lot of fans are going to benefit from having both networks, a lot more hockey, national hockey, on television this year. So for Keith Jones, Dave Molinari, this is Tom Reed. You have been listening to the 66 to 87 podcast.